Okay, so um, welcome everybody to uh, this month's meeting of uh, Hexham District Beekeepers Association, um, being the November meeting in 2021. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Dorian Pritchard, who's going to deliver our presentation this evening um, for members of, long standing members of HBKA. Dorian, Dorian needs no introduction, but for everybody else, uh, suffice to say that. His contribution to beekeeping has been literally immense um, over the years, uh, both locally and uh, the number of positions that he's held within our association, regionally as convener of the Northeast Beekeeping Convention for about 10 years. Um, Dorian Rand presented the uh, Kirkley Hall course, which trained up in excess of 300 new beekeepers for a similar period between 2003 and 2014. And he's a nationally recognized as a member of active member of BIBA and SICAM, the uh, International Association for the Promotion of Apis Marifera Marifera. And that's where the connection with this presentation comes in, because um, what he's going to tell us about today is a presentation that Doreen gave back in May to International Bee Day. Um, back then, it was the um, native bees to five strategy, uh, three strategy defense against Varroa. And uh, things have gone along since then. That's uh, inflation, I guess, because we're now up to five strategy defense. But uh, Doreen will explain all about that as we go along. So uh, this is a, a talk which will be reprised next year uh, as part of SICAM's ongoing virtual conference. And uh, Doreen is due to represent this back in, uh, in Feb ne February next year. So we're getting a sneak preview, a reprise of what he, to what he told everyone on World Bee Day and what he's going to tell everybody uh, in next February. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Dorian. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Jonathan, for a very nice introduction. Uh, as Jonathan pointed out, uh, my thinking about this has increased now, where I'm thinking about five strategies which the bees seem to use instead of three. I should say that if you have dark bees that look like mine and they're local ones, it's very likely that the method, the strategies that I'm talking about here, which I've found in my bees, also apply to yours. So you can look out for them if you now know what to look for. I should explain something about this word strategy before we move on, because most of us think of the word strategy as being a military plan or a political plan about which can be put into operation and has been thought out by somebody very intelligent or a, a committee of very intelligent people. We as biologists, we're not encouraged to think that animals have intelligence and can make plans the way that we can. I'm not sure that is completely correct, but that is the way we are told to think about them. But the another use of the word strategy in biology is in terms of an inherited behavior pattern, which has turned out to be, to be advantageous to the species. So that's the sense in which I'm using this term strategy now. So I'll move on now to the, the talk. So this is just really what I said just now. So we're talking about the strategies, not, not that they're thinking it all out carefully, but the adoption of an inherited behavior pattern that confers advantage. Uh, you don't need to be told this, but this is where Northumberland is. Uh, I will explain to the international audience that um, it's a, a relatively wild area of, of Britain and uh, the, the agricultural agriculture is not in the forefront of, a, of new ideas, and it may be because of this, uh, it can be seen as a virtue that we have native bees in this part of the world. So there hasn't been a great incentive to introduce foreign bees here, as there has been in much of Britain. This is one of my own bees on, on dandelion. And the important things here about identifying native bees is this, this amount of black here, the ratio of the black there to the light color there is, very, is really significant. And it's only in the northern, the northern bee, Apis mellifera mellifera, that you get this big difference in the, the, the light bands there rather than, dark, rather than broader light right. bands. <laughs> now, uh, uh, there's some, some background noise, which is a bit strange. Um, the, the, to, identify native, uh, to identify honeybees, though, we have a, a method where we can do what we call wing morphometry. 
And with that, you can make much better de determinations of what species or subspecies you're dealing with. Well, when I started beekeeping 40 years ago, the British dark bee was officially considered extinct. Well, I decided to try to backbreed it from local hybrid stocks, because I reasoned that the, the genome should still be there, albeit scattered about a bit. So I thought if I can reassemble it, then I, would, I should be able to end up with something like the native bee. Well, I collected about a dozen queen lines from Northumberland and Durham and selected them by an exaggerated version of natural selection. And the argument there was that it was natural selection that created the native bee in the first place. So the best way to get back to it is to do the same thing. Well, the outcome of this seems to be a, a sort of super native stock by which I mean it has some exaggerated behaviors compared with the other native bees that I've heard of. And in particular, it has a very strong resistance to varroa infestation. I don't want to go into the world picture on varroa uh, resistance, but there aren't many stocks throughout the world which show the sort of, or nothing, nobody else has the resistance that I'm describing. And most people's uh, the bees of most people uh, have a different kind of resistance. So this is something unique. This is what my bees look like. And as you can see there, we, we would say uniformly dark, uh, by which I mean that there, there are very few light features there. There is one down here I noticed, which has got a ginger band. If you can see where my pointer is going, <clears throat> the bottom right of the, of the scene, uh, there's a one bee there has a ginger band. And this is, uh, we'll see this later on. And um, yes, I'll just move on from this scene then. But that's what my bees look like. Well, <clears throat> Varroa arrived in this part of the world in AD 2000. Uh, and there was a great fuss about it at the, at the beginning. And I had some Varroa in my hives. I started treating them, but then I found that they didn't need to be treated. And I have not treated my bees against Varroa since 2002. So that's 20 years for over free, which is almost a world record, I think. However, I was unable to work out why my, colony, my colonies were apparently resistant. Then in 2010, one colony, JB5, which stands for Jarrow Black 5, developed a heavy infestation. Now, I had been, as a frustrated geneticist, I'd retired around the turn of the, the century, and I wanted to get to grips with a, 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 a worthy problem, shall we say, related to genetics. And I was looking forward to my bees getting infested with Varroa, because I thought I could then have something worthy to work on. But they weren't getting infested. Then eventually this one colony did turn up, it developed a heavy infestation. And this colony was unusual in containing many of these ginger banded workers that I just point out, pointed out. And because of the ginger band, I, I call them ginger bandits, and I still do. And now this was clearly an interracial hybrid colony. Um, in Britain, we tend to use the word hybrid rather loosely, and I'm afraid I'm guilty of this myself. Hybrid really means the result of a cross between two different species. Well, in, with honeybees, we're talking about not species, but subspecies. And so we're looking at uh, an, uh, or, or subspecies or races, as more, a race is the a commoner word to use, although some people object to it. But with, when I, if I use the word hy hybrid, I'm really talking about some a cross between subspecies rather than between species. And this is what they looked like. That this is not the same colonies I'm dealing with in, in this analysis. But you can see that a lot of bees with this ginger band here at the fore end of the abdomen. And I'm told that it, this probably comes from the Ligurian bees of northern Italy which were the foundation stock for Brother Adam's Buckfast stock. And so these are quite likely to be due to, to mating of my queens uh, with Buckfast drones. Although I'm not completely sure where that band comes from. Well, I maintained that colony throughout the summer without taking any action against the mites because this stock was heavily infested with mites. And as it fought its way through against the mites, and eliminated the infestation at the end of the summer, I watched what happened and took careful note to see if I could work out how they were doing it. Well, I deduced that my native bees are using five defense strategies. 
And again, strategies in the sense I, was, I mentioned before. The first is aggressive grooming. The second is winter close down of the brood nest. The third is pseudo swarming. Uh, that's my own term. Fourth is entombment of invest, infested brood. And fifth, and this was in another colony of the same one, mite trapping. Now, I, this idea of them using an inherited behavior pattern it is manifest in this second one, for example, the winter closed down of the brood nest. They did this long, long before Varroa came along, and this is a way of surviving our winters. But the point about this, the reason I mentioned it here is that they take advantage, or at least looking at it in terms of a battle against the Varroa mites, they can use this inherited winter closed down to their advantage so that they end up with getting rid of some of the mites as a result of it. Well, the first one, aggressive grooming. I think you know, you all know what Varroa mites look like. This is taken from the, uh, the, the civil service booklet managing Varroa. And you can see that they have these well-developed four, four pairs of legs. And they also have a, what looks like to our eyes like a carapace, which is known as the idiosoma. So these are intact mites, which are not, not being injured in any way. Now, what I, when I examined the mites which fell to the floor in my, this one hive, uh, the other hives, I rarely saw mites, and that's still the case now. I rarely see any mites in my hives. But anyway, in this one hive, there were many mites on the floor. In my analysis altogether, I counted about 900 mites. So I'm not looking at just a, a small number. It's a, it's a substantial volume of material. On the left here, these mites seem to be undamaged. At least I can't, under the microscope, <clears throat> see anything much wrong with them. So they're intact mites, which also fell to the floor for various reasons, but uh, the equivalent of old age, I suppose, in, in some cases. This one here has a, a gash out of the idiosoma there. And this is the same mite down below where you can see the gash there, uh, but it's also lost a leg there. And this, there's something a bit wrong with these legs here as well. Now these, these two here also have lost legs. And this one at the end has lost all of its legs and this one also all of its legs. There weren't many in this category here, but most of them which were injured fell into these categories here. And so what I did was counted that the numbers of those at, throughout the, the summer period. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But at the moment, we go on to the second, uh, second um, strategy, winter closed down of the brood nest. Now, this is a very interesting diagram, which I came across for the first time just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and it's drawn by Dave Cushman. It's from his website, and the title of this article is Population Dynamics of Honeybee Colonies. So you can find us on the internet. And you see that the year is represented like a clock face, January, February, March, so, and so on, up to December. And what this diagram here shows is the area or the number of cells which are open, what we call open brood. So brood is open from the time that the egg is laid until about eight to nine days when that cell gets capped over. And it's more or less the same in the three different casts of bees. During that time, uh, so what you can see here is that during winter from the beginning of December to about the end of February, there's a gap in that brood nest. There is no open brood there. Now, if you think of the plight of a varroa mite in a hive where there's no open brood, it has nowhere to go to hide. And it, to keep itself alive, it has to feed on the bodies of the adult bees. So during those three months in the middle of the winter, it, though all the adult mites in the hive are on the bodies of bees in the, in the cluster, in fact, in our bees. And so they're in a hive which has bees which are actively grooming. And when I say grooming, in this, it's, it's aggressive grooming where they actually kill the mites. They bite them. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Uh, but those, the damage that we saw just now is caused by these bees using their, their mandibles like a pair of shears and biting chunks out of the mites. But this then shows you that there's this, this gap in the, middle of the, of the, uh, in the middle of winter when the mites are all exposed to aggressive grooming 
by the other bees, provided that they have that behavior pattern to do the grooming. Third one, pseudo swarming. As I say, this is not a common term, and I'll explain what I mean by that. What I've got here is show is the the growth curve for the the colony, starting from April here. This was my first re first examination uh, in April at the, the spring inspection, and th those squares are meant to represent um, frames. And so you can see here that there were four frames with brood in them, and by brood I mean eggs or larvae. At that stage, there were just four frames of brood. And then what I've recorded here then is the number of frames of brood throughout the, the summer up until the middle of September. I didn't make any attempt at estimating the area occupied by the brood. I was just, it was just a very rapid assessment of how many frames there were with brood in it, with, in, in, the, in those frames. And what I found was that as, as the spring developed, this, at the third inspection, I was up to eight frames of brood. Now I'm, I'm using national hives where the full brood box, of course, is 11 frames. So it's just getting quite close to a full brood box when I'm only three inspections into the, into the year. And I thought I was going to rapidly fill up that brood box. So I took out a frame, that one there, and transferred it to another, another live hive. I left it for a week and looked again. And we'd gone up to nine frames of brood then, even though I had taken one out. And then I didn't know quite what to do there. A couple of days later, I decided, well, I think I'd better take out another frame of brood. So that's what I did. Took out that frame of brood, it went down to, to eight again. So that's minus one frame, minus one frame there. And then to my great surprise, a few days later, the colony swarmed. And I was in the in the apiary at the time, and I was very surprised that they'd swarmed because I hadn't seen any queen cells. And I immediately looked into the, into the hive and found that there weren't indeed any free queen cells there. But that, anyway, those bees left as a swarm. The old queen left as a, as a swarm, or what looked to me like a swarm. Uh, but because it didn't have queen cells, I, I, that, that's why I used the term pseudo swarming, because it wasn't really true swarming. I don't think, I, I would th say it wasn't uh, in my estimate, should we say. Well, after the, that swarm had departed, the, the, the colony then raised several queen, emergency queen cells, and I left one or two in the hive to, to survive, and I took two frames out which had queen cells on them, and from those, that's minus two there, from those I set up two nukes. <laughs> And an important thing about um, these, these, can someone turn off their, um, can they mute their, their computers, please? It's okay, Dorian, I've, I've sorted it. Thanks, Jonathan. Now, an interesting point now is that I have transferred frames which have varroa mites on them into four colonies, two nukes and two established colonies. And none of those colonies developed a varroa infestation because they were fully resistant, not like this particular colony here with the ginger bandits. So they were able to cope with the, that introduction of mites and they didn't develop infestations. Now, if you go on with the, uh, the rest, I'm losing my pointer here. If we go down, down the, this, can you see the sloping line here? This shows how the, the, the number of, the size of the brood nest decreased down to this point here when the new queen began laying. So that was towards the end of June here, and then it increased in, in size as, the, as she laid eggs, and then reached a plateau in July, the end of July, beginning of August, and then declined down to September. The NQBL means new queen began, queen began laying. So that's the, uh, on here of course, it says number of frames of brood and or eggs along the bottom of the months of the summer. Well, there's some unusual features about this. Uh, which I have already um, alluded to anyway. So the brood nest filled up so fast, I needed to replace two, frame, two brood frames, but the colony still swarm, but without constructing queen cells. I replaced two further brood frames that had emergency queen cells and, re and used those to set up new nukes. When I say replaced, I took them out and gave, put in frames of foundation, or it might've been drawn comb, I can't remember now. 
So the pseudo, this, this swarming then occurred without prior construction of queen cells, and it is therefore not true swarming. So, but there is a consequence of this for the departed swarm, because it means that the queen and her retinue escaped the problems of newly emerged mites. If she had stayed there, she would have had, or her retinue would have had the problem of mites appearing all the time, which they had to cope with. Now, getting away from that brood nest meant that she was off lay for a bit, but they had the chance then to destroy any mites which are on their bodies if, if they have this grooming facility. So they needed then to be concerned only with phoretic mites. Phoretic means they're carried on the bodies of the, of the adults, uh, only with phoretic mites on their own bodies, which they could destroy by grooming. So the departed swarm will get rid of those mites and can, go, can start up afresh with clean brood and without any mites there. I didn't know that's just an assumption by, on my part. I, didn't, I wasn't able to examine that colony, of course, because I lost the swarm. And I, as I've mentioned, neither colony supplemented with surplus brood developed an infestation, nor did the two nukes. That is, mite infestations were not triggered by deliberate contamination of healthy dark colonies with infested brood which is what I, I had learned over the years, 10 years, without getting any infestations. Strategy four, entombment of infested brood. So we're on to another strategy now. And I think this, this was something which had me baffled for eight years. I had the graph that you've just, you've seen, um, the graph with the, these frames of brood, on my desk for eight years before I tweaked that there was something very unusual about this, which I should have noticed straight away, but it took me all that time. Because you see this, this part of that, that uh, yellow frame graph, we, we've got the same things on the side here. We've got a number of frames of, with brood or eggs up that, up that way. And this is, this is June to July. And this is the, the, the swarm departed up here somewhere out off the left of that axis. And then, about five, about five weeks later or so, the new queen began laying. Now, at that time, in a normal colony, there should be no brood there whatsoever, because it's five weeks since those eggs were laid, since the queen laid any eggs before she departed. And yet, what I recorded was three frames of brood. See, that's three frames of brood, that is seal brood, which I was able to detect and I didn't pay any attention to it. I, it didn't occur to me there was anything strange about this, but they should have, that, that point there should have been way down here on the bottom axis. There should have been no frames of brood. And so there, there are these frames here then, and I've, I have also, as I pointed out, I have removed four frames from it. So I've taken out four frames of brood and there's still three frames of brood left there. So those, frames, uh, the brood in those must have been dead or dying. And uh, so they were, they weren't detectable as such because they were covered in, in cappings. So I think that's what the, was the case. I didn't at the time excavate them because it didn't occur to me that that might have happened. I just didn't, I didn't know what was happening. I was just following it, uh, just trying to record everything I could see. So it's inferred that when live adult mites entered the dark brood, brood that is which would develop into dark bees, they and their offspring remained in prison there, clogging the brood comb so there was no room left for the queen to lay. She then absconded and an emergency queen was subsequently raised. So this is, I'm, I'm inferring this from that three frames of apparent brood, which were present there at, at the beginning of June. And I think it's likely that the bandit brood, that's the striped bees, that brood probably behaved normally as, uh, as bees do and emerged as usual, liberating, it, liberating its mites. So the, the bandits kept the, the mites in population going, uh, but the, the dark bees that had, had received an, inf an invasion of a mite, um, they, they didn't emerge from, the, from their comb. So as I say, I failed to excavate it at the time, but I have excavated other old brood nests of my dark bees and I found dead mites buried in them. 
So this hypothesis is borne out by what investigations I've done, uh, but I, I've not done much in that area. Now, timing control of antiviral grooming, and as I say here, this is where it gets interesting. What I've told you up to now is fairly easy to understand. This is a bit more difficult to understand, but it's also more intriguing. To investigate what was happening, I put this varroa, varroa floor under the, the, the floor of the, uh, under the brew box and collected fallen mites that fell through that grid. And as you can see over here, I've marked this card with two inch squares so that I can count the mites which fell on it more easily. Now, this is what I found. This is now the total daily mite drop up here. And this, these are the, the, the months along here from May onwards. And this is, yes, this, this is starting off in the middle of May now. And the swarm departed about there. And what you see is a drop in the number of mites all the way through here like this up into, the, into September. And th this is the daily drop. So up here, this is about three mites per day. And this is about five mites per day, which, is, which are dropping. Now, if you look at the what is supposed to be the proliferation rate of varroa mites, as shown in the, this managing varroa, for example, the civil service instruction on, 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 mite, on, on varroa mites, they show, the, they show what is called exponential growth, exponential proliferation. And they show, I, I'll draw it over here, they show a graph which goes like this, way up there, way up high, sorry about that. Um, and what I'm saying is that that is a, it's a mathematician's way of frightening people who are not mathematicians. It, it doesn't seem to bear any relation to reality. I've scoured the literature for a real graph which shows a real colony of Roa growing at an exponential rate. And I can't find one anywhere. And surely if, it, if they did do that, there'd be loads of publications of this by now, but there aren't any, I can't find them anyway. What actually happened was that the numbers of mites just decreased and decreased like this onto the end of the colony. So there's something different between my, my bees and my mites and what the literature says. So the question is, how did those mites become damaged? And the answer is through aggressive aloe grooming by house bees using their mandibles. Aloe grooming means grooming ever others, shall we say, then auto-grooming is grooming oneself. Well, we know this from studies of the Eastern honeybee, Apis serrana, uh, which does, which is act, known to actively groom varroa mites and destroy them. And grooming severs their limbs and creates gash, large, great gashes in the idiosomas from which they bleed to death. And strangely, allo, well, strangely, it, perhaps not really, uh, it's something with, which, but I didn't know much about it is that aloe grooming is normal transient behavior in workers at seven days post-emergence. So bees normally go through a very transient stage, about a day perhaps, when they groom one another, and in particular the queen, uh, but they normally wouldn't do it as aggressively as they do which involving severing the legs off, um, off mites. And the what I've done here is plot the percentage of mites damaged on this vertical axis here against the time in the year again down there. And you see this strange, strange pattern, which I would not have predicted. And now it's a question of how do we explain that? But before we move on, it's worth recognizing that there's a German called Wallner who deduced that if a population of mites it gets damaged to the extent of 60%, then that population cannot survive. There's too much attrition for it to survive. So we have reached this on 70% there and 60% here. And so on the basis of Wallner's deductions, that colony is now doomed. A colony of mites, that is, rather than bees. And this is the reference of, by Wallner. If you want to know it, it's, uh, it's a, a German journal called Imkerfreund, Volume 34, pages four to five, 1990. Um, it, I won't read out the German there, some of you will understand that, uh, but it's, it's, a, it, it's really covering a whole lot of studies on, on bees. It's in German, by the way, so you need a, need a translation if you can't read German. 
Now, to, in order to investigate this, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to get rid of a bit of text across the top of my screen. Anyway, um, what I did then, I was trying to understand how I got that shape of graph. And one of the things I did was plot the percentage of mites damaged. So I'm, I'm trying to work out why the percentage of mites damaged. Let's go back to that last one because I didn't explain it properly. Oh, sorry, it's the wrong one. Um, yes, I, I, there we are. So it's this red graph. What I've done here, I've, yes, I'm, I've just realized I've uh, missed a few things. Right, here we go. Um, if you plot the percentage of mites damage, that's the red circles on the same graph as the numbers of frames of brood. This is numbers of frames of brood up, up this side, and that's the percentage of mites damaged on that side. You see that there's some parallelism between the two, especially anyway, after the middle here, which is when the new queen began laying. Down here, there's not that parallelism, but up here there is. So it looks as if the, the, the progress of this colony can be divided into two phases, phase one here and phase two here, divided by this, um, this the, when the new queen began laying there. And I got over here, swarm departed. That's old queen stopped laying, OQSL, and the swarm departed then. New queen began laying there. So I, one of the things I tried was plotting the percentage of mites damaged against the size of runes. That's two, those two parameters, plotting them against one another to try and elucidate that bit where they were in parallel and ever, uh, almost parallel, and when they were not in parallel. Now, something that, well, in phase one, this is what I found. There was, it looks nonsense. There's no relationship there at all. And, and you wouldn't expect a relationship, at least I wouldn't. So we're looking at the percentage of mites damaged in relation to the number of frames of brood. There's no reason to expect that there would be any relationship at all. So that's what you might expect. But then when we go to phase two, this is what we find. We find an almost perfect correlation between the percentage of mites damage, so this is the efficiency of, of killing, if you like, against the number of frames of brood along the bottom. Now that is a great mystery. Uh, that you can calculate, when you get something like a straight line, you can calculate what they call a correlation coefficient. And this is given the symbol R, which is down here in the, uh, on the bottom right hand corner. The R value for this is 0 0.98, which means it's 98% perfect a 98% perfect correlation between the two. Well, that means there must be some real relationship between them. And this, this is here as a p-value, which says it would only occur once in 10,000 times by chance alone. If you had, say, raindrops on a, on a, falling on a paving stone, you wouldn't get a straight line like that. It would be a chance of one in 10,000 times before that you would get it. So what is the basis of this correlation? Well, I don't know. It's still a mystery to me. But this exceptionally close correlation means brood nest size must have a very powerful influence on allogruma activity, or possibly the other way around. That's a bit of a strange thing. I can't really understand either theory there, but you may be able to think of something which would explain that. So that is the, that is the big uh, unknown as far as this is concerned. But if you look at these patterns again that, that we saw just now, where the, you've got the two, the red and the yellow points marked on the same graph, what you do find is that this peak here, this, this, where there's a high percentage of mites being damaged, up to 70%, it coincides very well with the capping interval. Because you remember that the old queen departed up there, or the swarm departed up there, it says swarm departed. And then uh, they, they would be capping eight days after those eggs were laid, and then capping so stops because there are no new lay, no new new eggs, and no brood left there to be uh, to be capped. So there's an interval in the capping, and this peak of of damage activity, uh, uh, damaging activity, on the mites coincides with this capping interval. In phase two, it it, it doesn't show that. Well, the reason for that coincidence between the capping interval and the peak in the mite damage 
is because during the capping interval, the mites are exposed to attack by allogroomers, being on the bodies of adult bees, just the same as during the midwinter brood break. So a point now is where do allogroomers come from? I mentioned that they, they're transiently uh, behaving like that at about seven days, but where do they come from? And to get to this, we need to look at the regular development of bees. And some of the, those of you who have been um, on my course, anyway, I don't know what Ian does about this now, uh, but you will have learned about the, how the, the bees go through these trades, if you like, occupations that they develop, starting off polishing brood cells, feeding larvae, attending the queen, removing debris, secreting wax and so on, and they end up as foragers down here. Now the stage here, which is marked with a horizontal arrow, is the time when they, uh, they do their transient grooming behavior between attending the queen and removing debris. And something that's very intriguing is that this progression through these different trades or occupations coincides with increasing titer of juvenile hormone. Juvenile hormone is a hormone controlling development in, in all insects, as far as I know. It's ubiquitous, it has a very important role. And it looks as if this progression through these different um, physiologies and behaviors relates to the amount of juvenile hormone which is present in their bodies. And so what I'm suggesting is at that stage there, seven days, there's something happens to the development of the juvenile hormone, which directs them into allogrooming permanently. So they remain at that stage in effect. And the, the, my suggestion is that that could be some kind of trauma uh, because you tend to find as in humans, for example, if people suffer a major trauma, then their hormonal regime becomes seriously disrupted. So it could be something like that, but there's no evidence for this. This is just my own ideas. So they're recruited from seven day worker bees already engaged in grooming nest mates. And the normal progression through this, these task sequences is controlled by juvenile hormone. And I'm suggesting that it could be because of this, this being arrested at the equivalent of the seven day stage that they stay as lifelong halo groomers. And there's one bee uh, which was seen for, I think 80% of its life, 84% of its life it might've been, uh, it did nothing but groom its nest mates. So you do get these specialist aloe groomers. And this seems to be what's happening in the case of mite infestations, that these specialist aloe groomers become favored and more of them or a better activity of this stage of bees is, in, is increased. Uh, and that seems to be a specialism which arises as a response to the mite infestation. So to summarize the controls then on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the, the percentage of mites damaged, these symbols which are here marked yellow coincide with the capping interval. It seems to be that which, which causes that peak. And then this, this here, the second lot, which are marked in red, relates to renewal of laying by the new queen. But I don't know how that works. But as we, as we pointed out before, uh, it, the, the percentage of mites that are, that are damaged is directly proportional to the numbers of frames of brood. Well, brood breaks then and capping intervals seem to be very important. And these occur after swarming during forage gaps also, like the July gap, which we have in Northumberland, which is known as the June gap further south, and also during midwinter. Mid and each of these has two effects. First of all, disruption of mite reproduction, because there's no brood for them to get into, so they can't reproduce. But also those mites that can't get into the brood, they're exposed to attacks by groomers. So there are two influences which are detrimental to the mites, which follow or which come out of these capping intervals, which arise from brood breaks. And so these effects must be major factors in our bees in, in relation to resistance of tuvaro infestation. Now, this is um, a completely different thing, but this was observed in the class at Kirkley uh, when I was surrounded by students. And it was very embarrassing to me because I had told them that they wouldn't see any mites in my hive. 
but we had some queen cells there, which I was destroying because I didn't want them to, to, to swarm. And lo and behold, discovered a whole lot of mites. And I believe this is a new observation for hon honeybees. I've never heard of this anywhere else. But when we, when we broke open this queen cell, there were 14 mites inside. And it was an unusual queen cell. You see that it looks, looks to me a bit like a shuttle that, in a, a sewing machine. It, it looks as if the outside of the queen cell has been strengthened with wax. And so I think that that queen would not have emerged. It looked as if she was at about the pre pupa stage. So these mites would have gone in recently, not, they haven't reproduced in there. They've gone in just in this, this one case before it was capped over. And uh, yes, I was gonna say something and I've forgotten what. So she's, um, oh yes, that's right. The, the one thing which is, which I do know about, about this sort of thing is that queens don't normally have they, I understand, almost never have mites in their cells. And the reason for this is that the queen cell royal jelly is normally repulsive to varroa mites. It's considered to be repulsive anyway, but in this case it wasn't. The mites went in there and it looks as if the bees recognized that there were mites in there and they walled them in. So this thick wax wall could have prevented the, the queen and the mites that they were carrying and the viruses that the mites were carrying. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so they were prevented from escaping. And what intrigues me greatly is whether this, this was intentional, in which case it might really look like a strategy, or whether it's accidental. And accidental things like this tend to be the sort of things which are adopted by evolutionary selection and can become a behavior pattern later on. So, as I say, I've not heard of anyone else reporting this and so, if, but if you have, have seen mites in queen cells, then uh, that would be very interesting indeed. But as I say, I've only seen it once, and uh, and that's what it that's what it looked like. So, in summary, then, aggressive allo grooming kills many adult female mites. Then, that's the first one. Uh, that's the first strategy. Then, a three-month winter break brood, sorry, brood break disrupts mite reproduction and also exposes mites on bee bodies. Brood breaks due to forage gaps would have the same effect. So that the forage gap related ones you could consider to be another strategy if you like. Then third non-emergence of infested dark worker bees hides mites and the viruses they carry below the floor of the brood nest. That's like that's those three frames of brood that I found in the middle of the, of the, the summer, um, they, if they had mites in those cells, they're hidden below the floor in effect, and the viruses that they carry as well. And pseudo swarming, as I call it, is promoted by clogging of the brood nest, I suggest. And this separates the queen right population from larval mites and induces a brood break that exposes all mites in the resident, resident colony to allogumas. And then lastly, construction of traps from strengthened queen cells baited with non-repellent royal jelly may be set, that's like setting a trap, to catch additional mites. That's speculation, that last one, but it's interesting speculation, I think. So the outcome of the, all this is elimination of all the varroa mites in the hive. So thank you for listening. <laughs>